So Guy Standing in his book, The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class, has a chapter on migration. This was published in 2011. If anything, well, we know the whole migration crisis in a lot of countries, the migration problem um, has just grown. And I have a subtitle there for a reason, and I want you to take this away, if nothing else. Constant instability the world over produces your Happy Meal toy. Um, the problem we have conceptualizing this is that we want to see this part or this part or this part of the problem. And the hard thing is to grasp the problem in its entirety. But for me, that kind of helps me to grasp it. Okay, In countries like the United States, developed wealthier countries, um, one of the reasons why the precariat class, which is growing, growing, growing in those countries, um, can still at least dream of a middle-class lifestyle, um, if not partake in it a little bit, is because, um, you know, we are flooded with, with cheap goods made with cheap labor, both abroad, in most cases, and, and, and here in the United States. And so people can go to Walmart and they can buy things that maybe only solidly middle to upper class people could buy in the past. And sure, they're cheaper and they're disposable. Our entire economy is disposable, okay? But, but the fact that you can do that apparently kind of, um, I don't know, it gives people a false hope. It gives people a sense that they're achieving something. And, uh, it, but, but at the same time, they feel like it could be taken away at any moment because they're not getting paid enough. They're kind of living on the edge. We've talked about that before. Um, and so uh, it's easier um, to blame other people to see just that piece, that it's, um, I don't know, Mexican migrant labor or illegal aliens or Somalis or whatever the group is in your particular country. After he says, in rich OECD countries, real wages and jobs with career potential are declining, creating a status frustration effect. Okay, let that sink in. This is from 2011, so 10 years ago. Think about what most recently happened in the United States, um, the election of Donald Trump, and even a kind of mini insurrection of the Capitol. A uh, lot of anger in the United States, and I would suggest that this is a big reason why that underlies a lot of the other things that people aim at, right? That, that they might aim at, you know, um, stopping migration by building a wall, um, but what's really instigating the anger is probably that feeling, that sense of precarity. Real wages and jobs with career potential are declining, creating a status frustration effect. Those becoming unemployed face the prospect of jobs offering lower wages and less occupational content. In other words, less ability to grow and develop within that job to move up and to move up in both um, wage, but also in status, in, in expertise, okay? He said, as it is unfair to criticize them for resenting this or being reluctant to give up on long acquired skills and expectations. So we've talked about this, but you know, basically more and more of these jobs don't require skills. They've tried to de-skill those jobs so that anybody can do them, so that you're, you can be replaced by somebody else who will take a lower wage. So there's, there's something to the fear, okay? But who is doing this is the question that needs to be asked again. And thinking about, you know, um, what people say as opposed to what they do and what happens, okay? The truth is that uh, corporations have been allowed to move all over the globe um, and to acquire cheap labor, labor wherever they could, to shift and change within countries as well as amongst countries as they see fit. Um, for their bottom line. And this has produced a huge market for precarious labor and particularly migrant type labor because it is the most vulnerable, the most malleable, the least likely to ever complain. And as they do this, yes, 
other people who who are in categories that have never experienced that precarity before start to fall into it. Okay. This is a side effect of the type of economy that we have now. It's it's aided and abetted by politicians who could have said no and could have resisted and could still modify it. But it otherwise is kind of a machine that runs on its own. And without enough regulation or modification or changing it, this is exactly what you're going to get from globalized capitalism. This is it. And uh, so it's, it's, it's nothing less than that. Um, and, and Standing basically says that. He says when polit politicians play the populist card, blaming the outcome on the laziness of locals, uh, which is interesting because I don't think they do. And populists here in the United States don't do that one anymore. But I do remember them doing that, just saying, well, you're not competitive enough. You know, you gotta got to get out there. But then when enough people were created that <laughs> created in this category that couldn't make a good living, it kind of got politically difficult to say that. Um, and they moved on to blaming others instead of blaming the laziness of the American worker. Um, he says, many governments have connived in this, okay? The government may speak um, a good line about, you know, protecting the borders from, from illegal immigration, um, from refugees flooding in and things like this, but at the same time, their policies are encouraging it or looking other, the other way uh, when it comes to illegal labor undocumented um, laborers. He says, many governments have connived in this, claiming that they're limiting migration while facilitating the growth of low-wage disposable labor supply. I found this graph on the web that shows just how dramatically immigration to the U.S. has increased since the, especially since the 1960s. And, you know, I mean, basically this upward trajectory, this couldn't have happened without, without the U.S. government wanting it to happen. So I think this is his point in a nutshell. What you hear and what actually happens are always two different things, it seems like. I mean, you need to look for that, whether it's, you know, dealing with individuals or dealing with a government. What they say and what they do, those are two different things, and you need to look at what they do, what the result is, and ask yourself questions like, do you think that the most powerful country in the world really couldn't stop certain types of immigration if it wanted to? Well, in ancient Rome, they were foreigners who were allowed to stay, but only under certain conditions. They could never enjoy the fruits of Roman citizenship. And so today's migrants, both um, documented and undocumented, um, count as denizens. And anybody who, you know, moves and changes and shifts to other countries and lives under a country um, that, it do that doesn't fully accept them as citizens could be a denizen. But I think in particular he's talking about um, this kind of vulnerable labor. Um, now, you know, focusing in on work migrants, um, this is a group of workers that standing argues countries and corporations want to have. Why? Because uh, they are very compliant, because they are undocumented or illegal, and so they're afraid to get out of line or to call attention to themselves. They can't, you know, seek help from... Um, any a government entity, if uh, if they're abused or not paid or un, uh, you know their contract is violated or whatever, um, and so so they're very malleable in that way, uh, and so you know what he's suggesting is that it's actually in a country's interest, in a wealthy country's interest, to continue to to make people who migrate to work in that country illegal. Um, because they're just completely vulnerable in that way. Um, in some countries, they are legal. There's more legal migrants, um, but they are limited 
they're severely limited. Um, there's a lot of rules, you know, how long they can stay in the country, for instance, maybe before they have to leave and then they have to come back again, whether, the, whether or not they can bring family members, what type of work they can do, whether they can access any sort of social services, um, including education and so on. So uh, the legal ones are kind of like, um, I would call them, you know, kind of true prolet proletarians, you might say, or um, serfs. Just the concept of constant churning and instability. Um, I thought that this list was actually really useful because we tend to, uh, you know, focus in on the problem of undocumented laborers. Um, and they have become a political and economic problem of sorts, and, and we'll talk about that um, in just a bit. But there's a lot of other sources of constant moving and coming and going in, in and among countries, circulating laborers, laborers who work for a while here, then they go to another spot in the country or, or to a different country, um, following seasonal labor in a sort of circuit. Um, Women make up a larger number of people uh, crossing borders for work. Uh, students as well. Um, there's an increasing number of international students and this creates more of a demand for um, jobs. Students are often willing to work, work for um, minimum wage or less. Um, but, and then he talks about the fact that there's you know a growing number of people in the, I would call them the pr professionate, I guess that's what he calls them, right? Um, the, uh, the professional class um, that, you know, never really call one country their home. They're jet setting around or they'll spend some time in the corporate headquarters in this country and either it'll move to another one or they'll move to a different part. The price that they pay for the type of money they no doubt make is high um, if they can't settle down have a family successfully, and so on. I don't know. I don't know. Um, we also have, of course, asylum seekers or political refugees, and he says there's a growing number of them, and that's certainly even more the case now. And also environmental refugees fleeing from environmental disasters or changes in climate that have made it impossible for them to grow their, their traditional crops. Um, hurricanes, floods. He talks about Hurricane Katrina and the huge impact on population it had um, on the Gulf Coast, in New Orleans, here in the United States. Anyway, there's all sorts of reasons for all of this coming and going, or churning as I call it, but one thing we need to keep in mind is that that all of this produces a great deal of, of instability. You can't, you know, your families can break down. Your extended family almost necessarily has to fall apart. So there's, you know, there's less and less of a, a safety net there. It, you know, for migrants of all kinds, who protects them? Uh, they are not in their own country. They don't have the citizenship status. And so, you know, they also have lost that, that ultimate protective layer of their state. Um, and so th this is just socially, I'm saying this in a very specific way, socially revolutionary in, it, in that it o overturns all, you know, all the social stability. It is not laziness or migration that is at fault. It is the nature of the flexible labor market. This is just the way it is. If you think about it for a bit, you'd have to admit it, right? Like corporations can go wherever they want and they will rationally seek the lowest, uh, you know, labor price as well as the lowest price for everything else in the process. Of course they will. And that's really not that, that's basically doing what they're made to do, okay? Um, but the result is going to be, and is over time, that laborers everywhere get paid less and less, goods get cheaper and cheaper, people go into more and more debt to kind of keep it going, but ultimately it's a contradiction.